In late summer 2019, a fraudulent claim against me was submitted to the Child Maintenance Service as part of a fraudulent family court litigation strategy, which had already placed my business in severe financial distress and led to me being made homeless, living in a borrowed camper van. After several months of proving, providing compelling evidence to the CMS that the claim against me was fraudulent, I received a call from their enforcement team that left me bewildered and in shock that a government agency would conduct themselves so appallingly and seemingly relish informing me that my pending bankruptcy would only temporarily protect me and they would use all their powers to enforce almost £20,000 of manufactured debt when the bankruptcy period of one year came to an end. It was this experience that led me to embark on a period of 18 months research into the conduct, financial reality and consequences of how the CMS operates. The outcome of that period of investigative research is a detailed 50-page report titled Parental Deaths and the Child Maintenance Service. Are parents in financial despair being driven to premature death? This presentation is a summary and explanation of some of the key findings and an overview of what has happened since the report was published in June 2021. Data, data for the study was gathered from a series of freedom of information requests, from CMS quarterly statutory reporting, from the Department for Work and Pensions publicly available Stat Explore database, from the CMS online maintenance calculator and other public data sources such as the Office for National Statistics, from the NHS, from the police, and also from a number of academic and think tank studies covering mental health, suicide, and the child maintenance service itself. The first set of results from data analysis showed that there was a significant problem of excess death among the paying parent population. But by contrast, the receiving parent population had a death rate some 2% lower than expected. The paying parent population split into two subgroups. Those paying parents without any arrears had a death rate elevated by 14.8% over the expected rate. But the paying parent group that had arrears had a death rate elevated by 1,428%, or in other words, a paying parent with arrears was 14.28 times more likely to die than a person of the same, sex, same age and sex in the general population. My report covered a period of 34 months from September 2017 to June 2020. In that period, there were a total of 2,871 excess deaths within the paying parent population of the Child Maintenance Service, which when averaged provides a figure of annual excess deaths of paying parents totaling 1,013. The paying parent population within the CMS is roughly split 95% fathers and 5% mothers. The paying parents who fall into arrears are in line with this percentage split. Separating the deaths of paying parents with arrears who were mothers from the overall figures, it was possible to calculate the rate of death for paying mothers with arrears and compare this to the overall rate for paying parents with arrears. The rate of death among paying parent mothers with arrears was even higher, at 1,527% compared to 1,000 428%, greater than the national all-cause mortality rates published by the Office for National Statistics. This is significant not only because the death rate of receiving parent mothers under CMS is 2% lower than the expected national age-adjusted death rate, but also because the mortality rate of females nationally is 25% lower than males. So to have a death rate among, pay, among paying parent mothers who fall into arrears, that is 7% higher 
than the already alarming rate of paying parents collectively who fall into arrears is very significant. The suicide rates for men in the UK at the time of writing the report were 17.4 per 100,000 of population, and for women, a much lower rate of 5.4 per 100,000. Male suicide in the UK accounts for more than 75% of the total. So nationally, women are three times less likely to commit suicide than men. Yet the calculations show that paying parent fathers who have fallen into arrears have a suicide rate of 1,756 1, per 100,000 of population, compared to the national rate of 17.4 per 100,000, more than 100 times higher than the national rate for males. But the situation with paying parent mothers with arrears is even worse, albeit that there are far fewer of them. If all the excess deaths among paying parent mothers are suicide, then the suicide rate for that group is 1,740 per 100,000 compared to 5.4 per 100,000 nationally, some 322 times higher than the national rate of suicide for females. These figures show that the CMS does not discriminate on the grounds of gender when it comes to extorting money from paying parent mothers, or from paying parents. Mothers who are paying parents are treated equally appallingly to paying fathers, and the consequences of this are borne out in the data. To put this into context, the average number of paying parent mother excess deaths each year under the Child Maintenance Service is 42. This is five more than the 37 women that the End Violence Against Women website states are killed by a partner or ex-partner each year. The question remains, however, as to whether the CMS is a key causative factor in excess paying parent deaths. The CMS refused to release key data that would have enabled me to make a determin on the determination on this question. Their reasoning for this refusal was that it would be a breach of data protection. However, th the deceased have no protections under data protection legislation. So it was necessary to be creative in identifying a compelling indicator that these deaths have a key causative connection to child maintenance service conduct. During lockdown for COVID in 2020, the CMS significantly reduced their enforcement act activity. Enforcement activity is published in their quarterly statutory reports. It was therefore possible to compare the level of enforcement activity prior to lockdown in 2019 to the level of activity during lockdown in 2020. The outcome of this analysis was that enforcement activity had reduced by 28.45%. And alongside this, deaths of paying parents reduced by almost the identical amount of 28.8%. It is these factors that, that add significant weight to the likelihood that the CMS is a primary causative factor in excess deaths of paying parents. This converts to approximately 300 parents who would almost certainly have died had the CMS continued with normal levels of enforcement during lockdown, but these parents were spared, at least temporarily. On to the key financial findings. The criteria involved in setting the amount of maintenance a paying parent must pay a receiving parent each month are how many children are being claimed for, how many other children is the paying parent financially responsible for? How many nights of care per week does the paying parent provide to the child or the children? What is their annual gross income? On the opposing side to the criteria used to calculate the maintenance due, 
the CMS do not take any account of personal self-support living costs, whether there is spousal maintenance also being paid, debt built up by the receiving parent in the paying parent's name, the conduct of the receiving parent, whether the mortgage or bills of the receiving parent are being paid by the paying parent, any other mandatory or essential outgoings of the paying parent, any income or wealth the receiving parent has from any other sources. Analyzing the CMS data for the amount of overnight contact per week that paying parents have with their children, it transpired that 91% had only one night a week or less of overnight contact with their children and 77% had no contact at all. I constructed 12 averaged paying parent profiles ranging from £10,000 a year salary to over £100,000 a year salary and I mapped into these profiles the average cost of sustaining basic living conditions. You can see from the table that the average paying parent who would on average have one and a half children would be in a deficit every month after meeting child maintenance obligations until they reach an annual salary of £40,000 or more. According to the CMS own data, the average annual salary of paying parents at the time of writing the report was just £21,590. So it's not difficult to see how a large proportion of the paying parents would fall into difficulty meeting CMS payments, let alone the surcharge of 20% should they fall into arrears. This problem is exacerbated dependent on two key factors, how many children are being paid for and how many nights of care the paying parent has of those children. We can see the inversely proportional effect that withholding contact by the receiving parent has on the paying parent and how much more severe it is when there are multiple children. By contrast, the reverse of this will be true for the receiving parent. The greater the number of children there are and the fewer nights of care they permit the paying parent to have with those children, the greater the level of income they will receive. Added to any benefits they may be claiming, added to any spousal maintenance they may receive, and and any income they are generating through employment or other sources, which of course is tax-free up to the first £12,500 every year. This creates a poverty trap for the paying parent, where their only hope of escaping that trap is to be fortunate enough to be able to land and hold down a very highly paid job or take on multiple jobs. But the higher paid the employment is, the higher the taxes they must pay, while the cost of maintenance will also increase, as will the cost of any surcharges levied by the child maintenance service. Therefore, perversely, this structure also creates a windfall of income for HM Treasury, because receiving parents' tax codes largely go under underutilised and in many cases are not utilised at all whilst the paying parent is pushed into increasingly higher tax bands, the harder they try to escape poverty. I calculate that the stealth tax benefit to the government as a result of paying parents having to push themselves into higher income brackets in an attempt to cope is in excess of three and a half billion annually, forecast to double by the end of the decade, which perhaps goes a long way to explain why there has been no parliamentary appetite to tackle this problem. The CMS have been the subject of accounting reports by the National Audit Office, where in the report above they state, the department does not tell non-resident parents that it will consider lowering repayments if they cause financial hardship. The department aims to ensure that parents pay off their arrears within two years. 
However, recovery of arrears can cause financial hardship. The department told us that it has a number of safeguards in place to review the affordability of maintenance payments and caseworkers can also use a debt negotiation tool to agree lower repayments where appropriate. The department told us that it does not tell people who have arrears about this option unless asked in order to encourage payment of arrears. So what's happened since publishing the report? When the study was published in June 2021, I sent a copy to every relevant minister and shadow minister, including the prime minister and the minister responsible for suicide. A copy was also sent to every MP and every peer in the House of Lords. A copy was sent to the chief executives of the highest profile mental health and suicide prevention char charities, to NHS leadership, to each of the mainstream news outlets, and of course, to leadership of the child maintenance service themselves. In addition to this, the report has been circulated to members of many campaign groups who in turn have sent copies of the report to their local MPs, to senior ministers, and to the child maintenance service. More than a year later, and there remains a media and political wall of silence. On 10th January 2022, Simon Franklin of the Child Maintenance Service emailed me to ask for a copy of the study in connection with their independent review of how they support victims of domestic abuse. A copy was sent to him the following day. On the 1st of June 2022, I wrote to Mr. Franklin to question why there had been no further communication, despite almost six months passing since sending him the report. I highlighted that in that six-month window, there had been no dialogue with me or groups and organisations who support the affected parents. There had been no preventative measures to stem the alarming rates of mortality among paying parents. And in that time, the CMS have actively pursued from Parliament further enforcement powers to add to an enforcement regime that is already the strictest in the world and that they are aware is causing such an extreme level of harm. I also highlighted the increase in CMS media activity espousing the well-worn deadbeat dad narrative, driven largely by press releases issued by the CMS themselves. Such as this from the Mirror, and this from the Sun, and this from the Guardian, this from the Mail, this from the Express, and another from the Sun, which became the subject of an official complaint to the Independent Press Standards Organisation, who upheld the complaint, ruling that there was a failure to take care over the accuracy of claims being made, that the ac inaccuracy was significant and was an inaccurate representation of official statistics. In my email to Mr Franklin, I went on to highlight that, given the seriousness of the information contained in the study, and that it makes compelling link between the CMS conduct and premature paying parent death, that the CMS had not invited any representatives of groups supporting paying parents to have a seat at the table. I pointed out that it seemed a reasonable expectation that the CMS would have taken interim remedial action without delay, such as to immediately suspend all enforcement activity pending an internal review and to immediately review the cases of all paying parents who have died in the time period encompassed in my report and any subsequent deaths with the specific aim of cross-checking those deaths with official death certificates to determine which cases are confirmed by a coroner as having been death by suicide, then focus investigative effort 
on reviewing each case confirmed as death by suicide to understand in detail the conduct of the CMS in each of those cases. I closed out my email to Mr. Franklin by saying that it seems to me the CMS would want to demonstrate that the contents of my report are wrong and in doing this would carry out internal inquiries with an appropriate level of transparency. Failing to do that fuels public belief that CMS personnel are content to allow this harm to continue while working out how they may prevent the truth from becoming public knowledge. Instead of adopting a reasonable and responsible approach to reviewing the content of my report and engaging with me and victim support groups, the position of Baroness Stedman Scott, the minister responsible for the child maintenance service, when challenged on the content of the report, in a letter from Weira Hobhouse, MP, on behalf of a constituent father, in her reply on the 25th of January 2022, Miss Stedman Scott said, The service does not recognise figures that seek to make a correlation between it and the suicide of paying parents. Sadly, a small proportion of people going through emotional crisis in their lives, such as relationship breakdown, will take the tragic step of ending their own lives. Let's focus in on this passage the relationship breakdown given as an example of why parents may be committing suicide is the same relationship breakdown by default that the receiving parents have gone through as well. Yet that group of parents has a death rate 2% lower than the rates published by the Office for National Statistics. And this is all the more curious because a simple search of Google for domestic abuse link to suicide brings back 844 million results, suggesting that if relationship breakdown is a key factor in suicide and experience of domestic abuse is also a key factor, then the 59% of receiving parents claiming an exemption from the £20 application fee due to their claim that they are victims of domestic abuse are at extremely high risk of suicide, yet the data shows they are less likely to die than were they not a child maintenance service receiving parent. Apparently, as much as 59% likely to have suffered the emotional crisis of relationship breakdown in combination with being a domestic abuse victim. Alarmingly, the percentage of parents claim exemption from the application fee due to domestic abuse has been on the march since introduction of the exemption in 2015, starting out at 28% making the claim, reaching 59% at the time of writing the report and projected to reach 100% at the end of 2028 if the same growth trajectory continues. But that's not the only thing that's been on the march. The CMS has seen remarkable growth in case numbers. In March 2015, there were just over 87,000 paying parents. At the time of writing this report, that had ballooned to over half a million. And following the same growth trajectory, the one million paying parents milestone will have been reached by the end of 2028. This growth is in spite of the fact that marriage rates have fallen by over 20% in the age ranges of most female applicants to the child maintenance service. The divorce rate has dropped by 37% since 2004. The birth rate has declined by 12% since 2012. And domestic abuse reports to the police have fallen by 30% since 2005. This saturation of the addressable market of separated families by the child maintenance service is very bad news in terms of the national suicide rate if urgent action is not taken to tackle this organization's framework and conduct. We can expect that by the end of the decade, the overall UK suicide rate will increase by 20% and 
and a further 2,000 children each year will suffer the traumatic, premature and permanent loss of a parent for the rest of their lives. In my view, the position of ministers and senior management responsible for the CMS amounts to institutional DAVO. A quick search of Google confirms the definition of DAVO to be deny, attack rev and reverse victim and offender. So the denial. The service does not recognize figures that seek to make a correlation between it and the suicide of paying parents. The attack from the mirror, from the mail, from the sun, from the express, from the guardian and from the sun again. And as if that wasn't enough, this latest attack on the very liberty of already dead broke paying parents is certain to increase the number of suicides driven by the CMS rather than fulfill their duty of care and prevent further loss of life. If you are an employer with staff who are subject to a deduction from earnings order, I ask that you do the following urgently. The child maintenance service have a duty of care to your employee to ensure that they are not collecting beyond what your employee needs to retain in order to meet their own basic needs. The CMS are failing in this duty of care. So that duty falls on you as their employer, their colleague, and in many cases, their friend. To achieve this, you should suspend your compliance with deduction of earnings orders unless the CMS carries out individual risk assessments for your staff. And those risk assessments legitimately conclude your employee will be left with sufficient income to meet their basic living costs. By complying with the deduction of earnings order without the consent of your employee, employers are breaching their employee's contract, as well as putting their health, well-being, and perhaps even their life at risk. Employers should consider, should consider offering employees redundancy terms and rehiring them as independent contractors rather than complying with deduction of earnings orders so that they can gain a level of control over their finances and a line of safety between them and the child maintenance service. Please reach out to me if you need guidance on this. Thank you very much. <laughs>